Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the second part of this two-part series centered around Robert Durst. For those of you who don't know who that is, go ahead and check out the first video of this series where I give you a background as to what is happening in this case, and then we'll go ahead and well, continue in this video. So in this one, like I said, this is the second half and the latter half of this video is where much of Durst's specific tells of nonverbal communication that gave me a heads up during this case that he was guilty. This is where a lot of it starts coming out. So big, big video on, in, in that regard, I suppose. But I think that's enough talking. Let's go ahead and roll the intro real quick here. Today's video is brought to you by one rep. There's a few techniques in the charlatan psychic circles called warm, cold, and hot reading. While cold and warm reading can be impressive if the techniques are done well, hot reading can be done by just about anyone. In a hot read, the psychic or magician or whoever is doing the read will have already done research on the person they are reading and they're simply using established information as if it were supernaturally divined to them. It's more or less the lazy man's approach to being a fake psychic. Not surprisingly, one of the most common places to obtain seemingly personal or sensitive information about nearly anyone is to simply search them online. You can unlock things like their phone number, their current address, their previous addresses, their current income, where they might work, and the list goes on. When this information is used by some charlatan, it's pretty harmless. You might be out a few dollars if you paid for it, but people can use it for much more nefarious things. Think of what can happen if scammers use this information to hijack your accounts, steal your money, or use your identity in some fraudulent criminal scheme or something along those lines. This can be done towards you right now and your family. Pretty comforting, right? This is where OneRep comes in. OneRep automatically scans over 100 data brokers and people search sites such as MyLife, WhitePages, Spokio, and others that publish your private information for everyone to see. The platform removes all of the listings found, like I said, automatically. You don't need to do anything yourself. OneRep sends out an opt-out request to each site on your behalf so you don't have to. No matter how complex the opt-out process of the site is, one rep will persist until your information is removed. Then one rep revisits the site over and over and over again to check to make sure that your information hasn't been put up again. If needed, the removal starts over and over again. This will make it to where it is extremely simple to use and it works very quickly as well. I actually wanted to screen record me using it for the first time so that you could see kind of what that would look like for you if you were to do it as well. And it happened so fast that all I was able to catch were the results of the very first scan at the very end. If you would like to be able to protect your privacy and that of your family, sign up with one rep right now and get 60% off a one year plan with an exclusive offer for the viewers of this channel here. Follow the link in the description below and it's only $5.85 a month if you choose to protect only yourself and $11.95 a month if you sign up your entire family. Lastly, one rep is backed by a 30 day money back guarantee. So you can even have a trial period to see how it works and experience all of the benefits without worrying about losing money. Again, follow this link in the description below and one more shout out to one rep for sponsoring the episode and back to our regularly scheduled programming. Okay, now with everything out of the way, I think we are now able to begin the actual analysis itself. So let's do that. Did you have anything to do with the death of your wife? I don't know that she's dead. Do you think that it's possible that she's alive now? It's possible. Not likely. It's not what I think. I think she's almost definitely dead, but I don't know that she's dead. Um, so I'm going to point out a couple things. First, just on a technical term, when I captured this footage, something happened in between me capturing it on HBO and the capture software to where it did this horribly out of out of sync frame rate thing. So I had to figure that out. But 
Couldn't get around that. Now, speaking on his nonverbal communication, if you remember from the last video, he is very, very rich in his nonverbal communication activity. He has a very active baseline, a lot of ticks and a lot of facial movements that are in there that are gonna make it a little bit more difficult to really pull out the minute tells that could be more telling. So that is something that I have to take into consideration and I absolutely have here. So as we're seeing these, especially his uh, heavy blink and grimace tick that comes up again and again, I am still keeping track of where it does pop up because just because it is a tick doesn't mean that it isn't caused by a stressor. So it's still something that we have to keep in mind as we move forward. Put a finer point on it. Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of your wife? No. I don't know where she is. I don't know what happened to her. I don't know how it happened to her. I had nothing to do with what happened to her, except very um, obliquely or whatever you would, and that it was a bad marriage, and that was at least half, probably a lot more my fault. But other than that... Okay, so something that he's doing verbally here, which I brought up in the video before, and I will be referencing it and refreshing a little bit on some of the topics covered there, just because it's been a decent amount of time. So he does a good job at perception management to the people around him by admitting his own faults. And he stuck to that very rigidly throughout the entire case. He would always admit to his own faults, which lent him credibility in people's eyes, whether or not they really wanted to give him that credibility. It's something that subconsciously affects us is if a person is willing to admit their faults, then that kind of encourages us to trust them more. So he admitted faults, which meant that we wanted to trust him more, but he didn't admit everything. And when he did deny the things that he was accused of, he did he did it very quickly and almost as if it was not needed to be processed or he wasn't like worried about being caught out in a lie. It was automatic. He would just be like, no. So in this area where he responds, no, he does a very strong accenting nod there that no, that thing. Now that that's not a desynchronization because that's a pretty broad movement that you can, anybody can do that. So instead of it being like a, a no, it was, it, was a, it was a no kind of thing. So we see that in there. So that's not a desynchronization. But what I will say is that he then goes further beyond that and adds some information to it of being like, oh, but how about this? And then yeah, I didn't do anything about this. I have no idea about this. And then he just keep, keeps adding on to it. Now he has packed narrative before in the past and it's still something that we wanna pay attention to. In this situation, this wouldn't be enough information at this moment, this question to be able to say, oh, he's, he's lying here. But there were definitely a few points of interest, a few red flags that we're considering in this group. Let's continue forward. And I had nothing to do with what caused her or what happened to her disappearance, inner disappearance. There were a series of collect calls made from Ship Bottom, New Jersey. That's on the coast somewhere. Yeah. So there are... Th okay. So obviously this isn't like the full interview. I tried my hardest to be able to get specifically footage of just... Robert Durst and the interviewer talking so we could get a good nonverbal read on this. So we're missing some of the aspects of this. If you would like to see the whole thing, go watch the Jinx documentary. It's on HBO, like I just said, and it will be in the normal frame rate rather than whatever my computer decided was the best way to capture it. So there's some context that you're missing here and some of these questions are rather loaded that the interviewer is giving. And what's interesting to me is that he's talking about these calls coming from a certain location. And this, this is in relation to him more or less being put at, closer to the crime scene, these calls being made. So Durst responds to this by, he, he, he likely knows about these calls. I mean, he, he, he likely made them. So he knows about them, but instead of being like, oh, what, really? Wow, I've never even heard of that location before and try to push all of the attention away from him himself and make him seem completely innocent, which would be something that you would expect a, a guiltier person to do. He says, oh, that's down by the location there. And I, he, he shows that he relates to it. So he's not separating himself verbally from it. He's actually attaching himself by showing that he recognizes it. And it's still this perception management that blindsided so many people is that they would be like, oh, well, they'd hear him say, oh, the, the one down by the shore or whatever like that. And then they would be like, well, 
I mean, he obviously isn't that nervous about it because he's, he's that happy to talk about it. So it was this very subtle manipulation that he was very good at. Let's continue watching through this. Three calls made to the Durst organization from ship bottom. Now, you were the collect call guy, so I think the speculation is, well, Bob must have made those phone calls. Bob didn't make those calls. Bob was not in ship bottom. Can you think of any reason why these phone calls? So during that time where Durst is responding, except Bob didn't make those calls, he does refer to himself in that third person perspective like that. And I, I brought this up in the last video. It's interesting that third person perspective is a, a fascinating verbal pattern that will pop up in, in various people. And it can oftentimes be related to a form of narcissism as a person will perceive themselves as this grandiose character or something along those lines. I don't know that that's the case in Durst's part. What I will note is that he does shift extremely easily from talking in the normal first person perspective to talking about himself in the third person. And it's odd because his, his character, he's almost characterized by this ability to talk about himself as if he was the character of a book that he's talking about. And it's this disconnect that's just extremely fascinating, even down to him recollecting some of these events, which we'll get to here soon. I will let you know. Some of the events that will be talked about by Durst here are dark. He's talking about some of his less than legal actions. So just be aware of that. And if you're not interested in true crime stuff and you're worried about being bothered by some of the stories from, from these people, then I don't know why you're on a true crime content kick anyway. So I, but I did want to let you know, let's continue this calls, these collect calls would be made to the Durst organization during the day. I have no idea who made the calls. Were there other people that you knew of that would make collect calls to the company? Several, yes. Yes. Executives or family members? Interesting. So something that he does verbally, another verbal patterning that is just an interesting thing to me is that certain instances he will almost verbatim repeat what was asked as the answer. So did you do such a thing? No, I did not do such a thing. So almost that verbatim repetition side of things. And that is fascinating. It can crop up in areas of possible deceit, but in this, this specific context, there's not enough centered around that and playing with that to be able to say, oh, he's being deceitful because of this weird verbal pattern. But then along with that, we can see just his regular facial movements are highly, highly active and it makes it muddy for us because even in this, during his speaking, he has a lot of action in the corners of his nose, which is a big tell for disgust or disdain or contempt even at times. So when he has that action there already, that means that it's just gonna be a little bit more muddy when we see a genuine emotive response of disgust or one of those tells. So that's something in there. Now, he also had a false start where he was saying, yes, I know who would also make those calls. Then he does a false start, he takes a breath, he's about to say, and then he says, yes, again. I would wanna know like, okay, what you were about to say something there, well, and you wanna unpack that a little bit. Like what's going on, you know, do you feel like somebody is making these calls that is trying to perhaps Make it look like it was you. Something like that, just to be able to keep pushing there. I don't think that's the case, but it could get him to, one, relax, make it feel like you're not asking him about a, a very incriminating thing. It's almost as if you're trying to open a door for him to trust you more, and that's gonna help you get a better read non-verbally. Being able to be on the side of the person that you're watching or interviewing or reading is very important to be able to get authentic nonverbal communication. Because if you show that you're just there to be abrasive, just there to get answers and you just don't care, they will throw up every wall that they can think of to throw up and that will make your job way, 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 way more difficult. So just be as good and as charismatic as you can until the point comes, if that makes sense. So that's what this interviewer has done, and he's not reading nonverbal communication, but Durst has agreed to sit down and do this interview because he feels like he can trust this interviewer. It's, it, it, it was well done by the interviewer, and it's a really well done documentary. I suggest you go check it out. Let's continue watching this. Somebody had a, had a beach house and was calling and, and getting one of the receptionists, not the usual receptionist, to accept the call. That had happened periodically that spring and summer and fall. 
Do you have any thought about where she is, about where her body might be? Okay, so back on that, where he was talking about somebody had a beach house, he was doing the obvious defensive gestures and also in insecurity gestures of the shrug. It's, it's very clear, everybody knows, I don't know. So he's doing that, but then he also has his raised and tightened pitch as well to where it has that strain added to his vocal cords. It's a very thin sound that he's saying where he's talking about the beach house. So there, there's some sort of emotional strain around that and that doesn't, incriminate him in any way, but it is interesting that that agitation crops up around there. Why is he showing this agitation to hell while talking about somebody else who's plausibly staying in a beach house and making these calls? It's just interesting that it does pop up there and we're gonna kind of keep track of it as we continue forward. I have no idea. I wouldn't know how to begin. I wouldn't know if her body, if she was dead, I would not know if her body would be in the state of New York, or in the state of New Jersey, or in the Northern Hemisphere, or anything like that. What was your relation? So something that Durst always did well verbally again, and the reason that I keep focusing on the verbal is because so many people watched or heard Durst talk, and they thought to themselves, this person, while behaving weird, doesn't seem to be behaving guilty is what people would think because he just responded so bluntly and straightforward and was so good at that manipulation that I've brought up. And so verbally speaking, like I was saying, what he's doing is he's sticking very rigidly to the idea of him not knowing where the victim's body was at the time. That was his story and he stuck to it extremely well and even down to like moments in interviews of people being like, okay, so, you know, how long do you think she's been dead? Where do you think her body is? All these kind of questions that assume she's dead. He still would respond in such a way that it wouldn't, it wouldn't incriminate him that way. He would be like, well, I don't know that she's dead, but if she is, blah, blah, blah. So he was just good at, at trying to manipulate in that fashion relationship with Susan Berman over all those years. When Kathy disappeared, initially the first several years Susan was living, still living in New York. And I saw her frequently in New York. Then she moved to Los Angeles. Did you have contact with Susan around that same time? Yes. What did she say, if you remember? She wrote, Bobby, this is terrible for you. This is important to know. So during this time, he's talking about Susan. So Susan, man, just go watch the other video if you want these dynamics. So he's talking about Susan and his, him going and seeing her in New York because there's another crime centered around that as well. And he has this tone again come up. It's a pleading tone almost. It's higher pitched. It is a sign of agitation or nerves on some level. And it is pleading as well. And he's got his shrugs in there as he's almost pleading his case to the interviewer. And I find that interesting that he's really putting that on there, whereas in other areas where he would have just like the facts side of things, he would just state it. He would just say where he was, how he was, and nothing would be notable about it. Why is the agitation popping up here? It's just a question. It's just a red flag. Then after that, when the interviewer was like, okay, so what did Susan say? His tone, his voice, the quality of it changes dramatically. Instead of it being up here where it was strained and whatnot, it drops really, really low. And that is also a, a red flag to go from a spike up here to a spike all the way down here where you know that his baseline's in the middle. To see that sort of drop, it's, it's, it's a question. You know, why is he doing that? Why did that crop up there? What's wrong? With this, why is he having such a difficult time adding force and volume behind his words when it's talking about what Susan said? Something's going on. I have questions. That would be more or less the, the line there. So let's continue on. I hate that you have to go through this. Um, but you heard from her that she had been contacted by the police? Yes. Yeah. What did she say? The Los Angeles police contacted me. They want to talk to me about Kathy Durst's disappearance. Something happens to Susan then. Oh, not long after that, Susan Berman. 
So something else that Robert does very well is separate himself also from other people. He doesn't say his ex-wife, he doesn't say Kathy, he specifically lists her full name. That's a more formal way to address a person. Now maybe that's in his, maybe he does that. Maybe that's just how he talks to people as he says their first and last name. That could be a thought, it's not what he does. He doesn't do that to the interviewer, he doesn't refer to other people in that way. But he does refer to Kathy Durst in that way, whom he was married to for some while. And I find that interesting that he's trying to make a very clear emotional and, and even verbal detachment from himself and Kathy in this point. Just fascinating to me that that's something that's cropping up here as well. So let's continue. He was murdered around Christmas of 2000. How did you react when you heard about Susan's murder? I felt terrible for Susan. I was astonished that they were putting all this together, that I did it or I caused it to be done. Did you have anything to do with, uh, with Susan? So this is going to be an important question. Did you have anything to do with And we'll see what happens there. Bob or Robert does this big shrug, look off to the side expression a lot. He does it a lot and it's always in interesting times. It's forced. It's such a broad gesture and expression group that it's very forced and it's intentional. And he does that in these kind of crucial moments where it's it's an important question that's being asked or, or being spoken about. And he's trying to make a big show about it not being that big of a deal. And that is also a red flag, just behaviorally speaking, as a person is trying to downplay something that they're being questioned about. Now this could be centered around, there, there are many facets to a person's psychology as to why this could be. In this specific context, there are a few that do make sense, but it is at least just interesting in this specific context that he's doing it. So just because you see somebody else do something like maybe similar like that verbally, that doesn't mean that they're hiding something or they're lying or being deceitful because you have to consider the rest of the context and the person you're working with as an individual as well. So with Robert, it's odd. It might not be odd with, I don't know, Jane down the road, but with Robert Durst, it was odd. So let's continue watching. Let's see what his response to this very important question is. Berman's death? I had nothing to do with Susan Berman's death. Did you have any theory? Another exact repetition. Did you have anything to do with Sir Susan Berman's death? And he exact repeats it. I had nothing to do with Susan Berman's death. That almost exact parallel uh, is just fascinating to me. That regurgitation of information. It, it, it's an easy thing to be able to do in a lie to regurgitate a question that way. Did you do this thing? No, I did not do this thing. Just a, a quick turnaround like that. And I will say that he said Susan Berman there right after I said, oh, he doesn't ever refer to, and, but he's repeating once again verbatim what the interviewer does there. It does not crop up in his normal conversation. He doesn't say first name, last name. He, he, he has his own specific ways of referring to people. So I just, I don't know. This is, it's, it's all fascinating to see how a complex character can come out and and do and say certain things and influence massive amounts of people by doing them because it felt like it was like, I don't know, it's, it felt confusing, I think was one of the biggest things is that people are like, it, it, he's guilty, but it feels like he's not questions. You know, you know, let's go. Yeah, yourself of what might have happened to Susan? No. Does it make sense to you that there were people that suspect that is impressive, almost stubbornness, I would say, from Durst on that part. So interviewer asked, do you, do you, I mean, do you ever think to yourself, what could have happened to Susan? That's a big question because then that could be a, a subtle way of being like, can I get Robert to give up any details, inadvertently even, or perhaps even from reading in between lines of what he says, what he doesn't mention. It was a good question. And what Durst did is rare, is he answered with a one word, and even though the interview left the uncomfortable silence for him to fill, he left it at the one word. And that takes a lot of self-control. It's very uncomfortable to just sit in a silent situation like this, especially when you're expected to talk. So the fact that he just answered no, and then just sat there was impressive, and also interesting and unnatural. So big questions. Why would he just say 
no. And instead of answering and feeling uncomfortable with the awkward silence and filling it in with more details, he just stops at no. It's just a fascinating little red flag there that I'm keeping my eye on. Let's continue. That did you of oh, having- Oh, sure. I mean, me, me because she was my spokesman. All of a sudden she's dead right after Janine Pirro's doing the investigation of me. Mm -hmm. I shut her up. Is there anything that Susan knew as your confidant that you would have been uncomfortable with her telling the police? Well, we had lots of private things, but none of it had anything to do with Kathy. I mean, when Kathy was, you know, going bananas, we would talk about Kathy all the time. I couldn't imagine her talking to the police about that, uh, just sitting here right now. But so he didn't fully answer the question that was asked there. But he did in such a he, he he didn't answer in such a way that it felt fully answered, down to even mentioning Kathy. So the interviewer asked, is there something that would have been said that you didn't want the police to know? And he said, Oh, there were many things that we talked about, which literally would translate to yes, there were things that were said, but never anything about Kathy. And that part, I'm not sure. I didn't see any tells to be like, oh, he's lying in that part. But I find that interesting that after that, he only briefly addresses Kathy, which was the focus of the question, and then tries to pack it with other details about other things that might not be so related to Kathy, but still feel related enough that it diverts answers from the question. Long story short, Durst really did know how to interact with people to manipulate them well. It's, 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 different. It's, it's, it's interesting to see on display like this in an analytical form like this, but it's, it is definitely useful information. So let's continue. The police want to talk to me. I'm just going to talk to them. Is that all right? And I'm like, like, that was the conversation. Do whatever you want. And I went to the Wegmans, to the grocery shopping, get the newspaper. I don't know what gave me the idea that I should shoplift, see if I could get away with it or whatever it was. But I decided rather than the pay, I was just going to... So he's talking about shoplifting and he does this here, which this has popped up before. And this is a pretty big tell for him in the past where he's done a, a methodical massaging itch of this area of his head. And so he does a little, like a little itch there, right? But it doesn't seem to last the same way. It doesn't have the same pattern that the other ones does. And it doesn't seem to have the agitation behind it that the other tells that I've seen before have. It almost seems as if he's just itching his head. and. He did, for those of you who don't know, he did a really weird thing. As he was hiding from the police, he just tried to steal a sandwich, just shoplift a sandwich and was caught and kind of almost caused himself more problems. And this was another thing where people were like, if you were guilty of this, why would you do that? And it was utterly fascinating, the decision making here. So let's see what he's saying about it. Take it. As I was leaving, the, the two security people were out front and they have to talk to me. We're sorry, you'll have to come with us, blah, blah, blah idiotically I went with them um, and I was arrested. Data. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the psychology behind what he just said there. He, he just talked about how he went into a store and took a sandwich and that was, <laughs> that was a bad thing for him to do because he suffered some legal consequences from that and he still does his like big shrug, I don't know, not a big deal gesture that he does there that's very intentional, but the psychology behind his mindset here and actually what kind of characterized Durst in general was that it's almost as if he felt that the rules that are definitely real and apply to people didn't really apply to him or he didn't care enough about them to take them into consideration. And this played out in smaller areas and then this also played out in much larger areas and we can see this odd, separation from almost like a, a moral compass or even just a social moral compass, one that's based off of the social norms of his culture. And we see that separation come in to such a degree that he can just casually talk about even committing a small tiny crime like stealing a sandwich, but it causes him no degree of difficulty to do so. It's, it's no big deal to him. So it's, it's very fascinating and it will come into play here. Texas, you find somebody in your house who's not supposed to be there. There's, there's not much you cannot do to them. Most other states, what you're obligated to do is to call the police, do something else. You're obligated to leave. Texas, you're not obligated to leave. So this is in regards to an incident that, that 
frankly, we only have Durst's testimony on of the death of his neighbor, whose name was Morris Black. And so with this situation, this is the part where it's gonna be a little bit more dark, just so you are aware. With this, he's building up and talking about a very, very intense night. This was an, an extremely dark night, and it would be considered for anybody alive to, to go through what he's about to describe. And his build up to it is extremely casual, but then where it begins to be unnerving and like I said, shows some of his fascinating psychological separation from right and wrong, will pop up here and you'll get to see it in very, very cold light of day. And we'll talk about it a little bit. So let's go ahead and watch to see what that is. Like I said, buckle up. You, you can handle it more or less as you see fit. Obviously you're not supposed to kill them. I was scared to death. I couldn't leave this corpse in my apartment. I couldn't. I had to get this corpse out of my apartment, period. So what did you decide to do to get rid of the body? Well, I decided I'd wait till night and I'd pick it up and carry it out of there. And then I realized I wasn't picking up that body and carrying it anywhere because it was much, I mean, I wasn't strong enough to do that. I could drag it out, but I just couldn't see. I mean, I thought about putting it in a sleeping bag or something and then dragging the whole thing out, but good God, that's ridiculous. Now, Morris had tools. He had saws and, ax and um, axes, a giant axe. Uh, I don't think he had a, uh, I don't think he had a bow saw. Anyway, I went and bought a bow saw, and I got a bunch of garbage bags and stuff like that, and went back to, to, to the house, and um, I'm sure I got more stoned and more drunk, and I dismembered the corpse, primarily with the axe, but some with the bow saw, and I think another saw that Morris Black had. Was there something that was relevant in Gallup? Okay, so that was his description of that night and you notice the there are changes from his his behavior while talking about the build up to that and in the actual event his recollection of that event himself the most notable to me was a lightly softer tone a little bit less forceful and a little bit lower pitch those are usually related to more somber or more for lack of a better word negative emotions with anger sadness in those veins of emotions. So to hear that come out, that does make sense contextually with that. But what's interesting to me is some of the verbal patterns and then some of the uh, lack of nonverbal communication that we're seeing. So verbally speaking, he refers to the body as the corpse and he, he switches between body and corpse throughout his narrative and interviews. So that's not a big deal. But it is interesting that he will refer to Morris Black's tools, but then he will not refer to Morris Black's body as Morris Black or anything related to Morris Black. It's just the body or the corpse. And it's that odd object, almost objectifying of the corpse that is strange. It's, it's very unnerving as he talks about a human body being just another object more or less. And then he gets to the part where he's talking about his tools that he was selecting and they're talking about the bow saw. Now, for those of you who don't know, that was the that was the item he used, obviously. And so he he's talking about something that he did a very terrible thing with. And he does, again, this big overt, I don't know, big over the top intentional I'm making light of this shrug that has come up in other areas as well. And so with this context added in there as well, it makes me think, okay, so if this is how he responds to something that's so genuinely dark there, what are the other areas that he's doing the same pattern with? And why is it that they do seem to also line up with some darker questions in there? What's going on? These are all just questions that need to be asked as you continue forward and build this nonverbal character sketch of whoever it is that you're looking at. So these are some things that are popping up to me and I think they're pretty important things and they would have been had I been involved or had I been working with, say for instance, this interviewer or in the case in any form, these would have been the questions that would have been unavoidable and, and just, they would just need resolution. 
So we're gonna keep watching this and, and then we'll, we'll see everything come to a head here. Austin that, you know, would have had an influence where you knew that you were saying something that was uh, limited. Let me see what else I can think of where they didn't specifically ask it and I specifically didn't go there. I'd have to think about it. Next time you interview me, I'll have that. There it is again, the big overt tell. Now in this area, if you couldn't really catch it, I'm sorry for how it's cut. The question was more or less, is there any, are, you know, are there details that they didn't ask so you didn't say? You know, the don't ask, don't tell side of things. And Robert does an interesting thing where he's like, I've got to think about if there was any times where they said specific, or they asked specifically something and I didn't tell them specifically something. And he gives it a couple half-assed seconds of thinking and then does his overt, this means nothing to me, shrug of being dismissive to whatever is being talked about. It was almost, it's almost been frustrating along with fascinating to watch Durst interact here because he treats the entire thing as if it was just some form of game and instead of it being a very serious, real to life thing affecting many people, he just kind of acts like it's a fun toy to, to work with and that this is just a fun chat. And it uh, just, it doesn't align with the situation. The situation demands a certain response and his response does not match that situation. That's why it rubs many of us the wrong way. Let's continue watching. I'll, I'll think of a few things. Should we take a break for a few minutes? Want to take a break? Sure. Okay, so he's about to start talking to himself, but you could see Nothing really substantial happened with his nonverbal communication as the interview wraps up. He does a postural change, sets his feet up and crosses his arms and leans back, and that's not really neither here nor there. Just a posture change, different flow of conversation, different setting, and the folding of the arms is oftentimes comfortable. Could it be related to blocking or feeling insecure? Maybe, there's just not enough to say. Now he's about to start talking to himself, and this is important, and I'll talk about why it's important afterwards. Knowingly, purposely lie. Yeah. Knowingly, purposely lie. But yeah, and then they. Stop. 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 Talking to yourself. Your mic is hot, so we can't really talk. Oh, oh, oh! I was reviewing it. Everything up. Now I hear what you're saying. You could hear everything I said. I never intently. I wonder how do I mean? You know, it's a question of not what do I say, but how do I say it. I never intentionally, purposefully lie. Now I made mistakes. Did not tell the whole truth. Nobody tells the whole truth. There's a lot of... Okay, so during that part, a number of things are happening. He's almost coaching himself, and he does this repeatedly. This is a, a way that he works through and navigates, especially how he's going to speak. As you can hear, he's very thought through about what he says. So this is important for us to know, is that he, one, plans what he says and rehearses what he says to himself, at least regularly, and along with that, this rehearsal is him referring to himself and almost coaching himself. They're his thoughts and nobody else's. And this is characterized a couple different times throughout the documentary as he kind of talks himself through situations. This is extremely important to note because it's a very important detail later on in this case. And I think that this moment helps add clarity to the later moment. So that's why it's here. Let's continue watching. People out there who think I killed my wife, that I killed Susan Berman, that I intentionally murdered Morris Black, and it's quite possible that he's killed a whole slew of other people. That is what I would think if I was as familiar with the media as I am about me. Was your dad engaged in any way when Kathy disappeared? Did he do anything? 
Oh, he, he. So in there, we didn't get to hear the question. So I did note, like, I mean, I said it earlier in this interview or in this video that he doesn't mention the first and last names, but he does for both Susan and Morris and then doesn't for his wife. And I don't know what the question was before it because in areas that he has not been prompted to say their first and last name, he's been less likely to say their first and last name. So I, I just wanted to make note of that. That's important to say is that I've now seen a couple points here that perhaps even in the questions earlier, maybe it was something that was still cycling back around. Considering that context, I'm not gonna hold as much weight to the red flag of earlier, so it's important to consider everything that you're looking at. So earlier on, that possible psychological distancing between Kathy Durst and himself might not have fully existed there. We have to gather a little bit more. Now we've got a kind of a, a two and two situation here. So let's let's see what happens. He um, really, really wanted to leave it to me you think that, that um, Seymour ever thought that you might have had something to do with her disappearance? I haven't the faintest idea. I highly, highly, highly doubt it. But Seymour's thoughts were inscrutable. Another characteristic coming out here. I believe Robert Durst felt extremely isolated. I think that he felt himself as a very very island-like individual. He didn't have a mom. She died at a young age. His dad was a not great dad down to the, even how they refer, how Robert refers to his father is never in an endearing way and oftentimes talked about how bad his father was. And this also extra like separation that characterizes Durst's observation of the world around him. I do feel like Robert felt very isolated and perhaps elevated to the people around him. In the last video, he talked with Scorn about having to live as a normal person would. And so this, this grandiose view of himself is unearthed now and again and becomes more and more apparent. So that's still important to note in his psychology that he does feel elite. He feels aloof and he feels separate from the people around him. That makes it easier to do difficult things. Let's continue. And police, I think, made a big deal out of the idea that you had gone to California around the time that uh, Susan Berman was murdered. But I, I got there a long time before December 23rd, a long time before Christmas. The timing on, on all of this gets very, very tight. So there we saw Durst say a specific lie that he got there a long time before Christmas. And... He was vague with his lie. He got there a long time, and it wasn't a long time before Christmas. It was right shortly before Christmas, but he says a long time, and the only thing that would pop up in that moment would be the dropping of his tone. His pitch and quality of tone, again, drop off. Now this, like I said, can be related to somber emotions, but it can also be related to a lack of confidence or a lack of sincerity. If a person is not feeling confident in their words, they're less likely to speak them loud and projected because they don't feel that emotion behind it. They're gonna like just talk softer, maybe, maybe try to get some more words in around or mumble and see that maybe something will be mistaken anything along those lines, or it's a subconscious thing to where they just, they can't physically do it. So that's the only tell that really popped up there where he specifically lied. We got to see him lie and then show the evidence right directly after. And that's all that we really saw slip out. It's fascinating. It's very fascinating. Let's continue. Because it's a, a long way from Trinidad to Los Angeles. I would have had to go on from Trinidad to Los Angeles. I don't know when, the 19th, 20th, 21st or whatever. And then going back to from Los Angeles to Trinidad and then going to San Francisco and flown to New York. And they just include guys and you know, not much time to do all that. Mm -hmm. And the LA police have been investigating for a while now, and they're unable to put him in Los Angeles. Okay. Hmm. He goes through and he tries to, to explain away the timeline details, but still include enough vagueness. And I'm just curious as to why this is. This is this is a ways into the case by now. These aren't the first time that Robert has heard these questions or has had to consider responses to them. So I find it interesting that he's still extremely vague. 
like very vague with it. Oh, it's difficult. And if you start thinking about it, like the, the flights are long and it's your timing is gonna be really tight. Whereas if it were actually a mathematical thing, like you couldn't do it, why wouldn't he sit there and be like, okay, so I sat down and did the math. It takes six hours to fly here. That would leave a 30 minute window here to be able to get from this point to this point. Well, that takes this amount of time. It's, it's simple math to do. He didn't do it. And so either one, that means that he didn't care enough to do it because it would be an excellent way to rebuttal this. Or two, he can't do it because it's not an option because he genuinely did the crime. So there's a couple reasons as to why he didn't do that. It, either he's neglectful or it's because he's guilty. Not sure, considering his past and how he's handled things in the past, he doesn't seem to neglect details too much, especially with the rehearsal that he gives himself. So that kind of pushes me to believe that he's not being neglectful here, he's likely trying to hide something, aka he might be guilty. So let's continue forward. But they were able to put you in California. California is a big state. That's rough for me. This one's huge, and this one's not even like remotely attempting to be hidden, this cluster. California is a big state, so they were able to put Durst in California, centered around this murder, and they weren't able to put him at the scene, at the city, but they were putting him in the state, and when this is brought up, he has a massive contempt smile. Just a really, you could tell he's just real proud of that. California is a big state, big massive contempt. It even comes across to the other side, maybe slipping into derision along with that humor at another person's plight. And then after that, he does a pretty big, just like mouth blocking gesture here that didn't need to be there. There wasn't anything that he was wiping away there. It's just him being aware that he just did a massive contempt flash at somebody when they are asking him a question about whether or not he was in the state for a murder that he's possibly guilty of. So that contempt, that aloofness, for those of you who don't know, contempt is, is the showing of the psychological processing of believing yourself to be morally or intellectually superior to anybody else. So for that to pop up there, it feels as if Durst thinks that he just did a big, cool, like chess move there. Like he, he just, he just got checkmate and we should be impressed. Just very fascinating that that came up there, that contempt centered around that. Almost like, yeah, I was there, but you can't prove it. Hmm. So what do you think about this, about this note? I mean, does this note mean anything to you? I mean, that's her address. Block letters of somebody who's hiding their signature. And they spell Beverly Wall. Can you think of a reason why some... Now we're seeing it on the screen here. This, this note, the, the cadaver note, was left anonymously to the police, and it's a big thing, you'll see in a bit. But after that, it's a, it's a pretty big, important piece of evidence, and we're talking about it, and here has come up this little massaging itch. This is different than the one where he itched earlier. Now he's up here, now he's just massaging. This is an agitation. The repetition lets us know that it's a self-soothing. It's causing some form of psychological strain for him centered around this. And that popped up really quickly and really substantially centered around this note. That's a huge red flag. This would be something that you really keep track of and come back around and try to visit, which is done, so we'll do that. Somebody might write a note like that. I can't imagine. Can't imagine. One of the speculations is that if it was somebody that liked her, they wouldn't want her lying around in her house. Um, you know, if she had to die, she should die. If somebody liked her, why kill her? Somebody had a plan to do this. They had to go to her house, do what they did. And, and now you're taking this big risk. Which, which big risk? You're writing a note to the police that only the killer could have written. That's an important line right there from Durst himself. You're writing a, a note to the police that only the killer could have written because it had details. Like it, it was letting people know that there was a body in a house that there, there shouldn't have been people that would know that. It, would, it was a very specific note that only somebody who had inside information could have left. 
and it has some characteristics about it that are fascinating that are broken down down to the use of cadaver rather than body. Nobody uses the word cadaver, everybody uses the word body, unless it's maybe in medical field. Now there's a whole story behind this and you could watch the documentary for that, but that could be one of the, the verbal tells for it. Along with that, it's an interesting writing style that we're working with here as well. This block lettering that has these specific movements in there, and it comes back around here pretty soon. I mean, the police went on and on about how cadavers are wrong. You know, most people would say cadavers have body. And they would con conclude that that meant that the person had something to do with medical or ambulance services, somebody who was involved in that and would know and use the word cadaver for a body. Okay, so this is the end of one small part of an, of an interview. We're about to go to a different time, a different interview, back centered around the note, the cadaver note. And this is where things get pretty interesting, in my opinion, centered around Robert. He shows some very big tells. They would have been huge red flags. Huge red flags. You'll see. Excuse me. So I want to now. I want to ask you about a bunch of photographs and stuff. Um, some of it's all stuff. Some of it's stuff you've seen before. Some of it I got from you. Um, but that's for us me to... and my yellow horse. We're in Central Park. This one is you and Kathy. Could this be at her mother's house? Might be in Vermont. I still have the long bangs type. What was it? Um, Viking something or other hair. This is an interesting picture of you and Susan. Yes, I'd like to get a copy of this. Yeah. Yeah, you can have this one. Uh, so, so far the interviewer has been just showing pictures and being able to gauge emotional responses and it's allowing me to gauge emotional responses that Durst is showing in regards to these pictures and that's allowing us to really understand how he's behaving right now because a person can have a baseline for a specific instance and it can alter day to day as well. Just because a person has a more active baseline on one day doesn't necessarily mean that they won't have a more subdued one the next day if, for instance, they sleep more. So you have to really consider their baseline in context of them as well. But we're still understanding and we could see here that Durst is still his normal self. He's not doing anything overt or different as he's responding to these other questions, which just means that we do have a pretty reasonable pin as to how he behaves non-verbally. That's good to know, because that means that spikes, be it positive or negative, will be easier to note from here on out. All right, I want to ask you about this address. Susie. Now and again, I think about old times. GG, good luck, Bobby. Susie. What, what, what about the address? This office was it was your own office that you had for a period of time? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 when I left the, the family business, I moved my office downtown. Do you remember writing this to Susan? No, not at all. I left the family business in 94, 95. I do believe that he doesn't remember writing that to Susan. The reason that I believe that is because when he's sitting up to look at it, he does just the teeny tiniest head movement no right before he says no. And that little micro movement no before that is a pretty revealing one because that one's not one that you would intentionally do unless you had been taught to do something like that. That small kind of movement of the head like that. So that likely means that it's just a synchronization point between his words and his nonverbal communication, AKA, he likely doesn't remember writing that note. And well, that's okay. Let's continue. Susie, now and again, I think about old times. Good luck, Bobby. I don't know what Susie was doing. She must have been come out with a new something or other. Whatever she had, had published or whatever in 94, 95, I have no idea what that's about. My theory is that this probably was you sending her some oh, support. Oh, that's possible. That certainly is possible. I can easily see writing that letter and putting a check in there. I want to show you the envelope that that letter came in. Would you read me the address? 
Okay, we saw it come up here again, a little bit of that nervous massaging of the scalp, big mouth and touching gesture here. Just a manipulator could be a self-soothing oftentimes when you're like manipulating something around on your face. It's centered around self-soothing on some area, AKA there's agitation happening. This does make sense. All of these, I wonder if at this point, Robert was like, okay, I can kind of feel how this is going. I'm getting a little bit more nervous here because I can see I could see where stuff is going and I'm not super excited about it. So we could see these agitation tells starting to bubble up a little bit. That's important. On this envelope. Robert Durst, floor 2467, Wall Street, New York, New York, 10005. And who you sent it to? Susan Berman, 1527, Benedict Canyon, Beverly Hills, California. Beverly spelled wrong, California, 90210. Which, which is, you know, which is, you know the zip code that you want in Beverly Hills, but you... Okay, so now we're getting to the point. Beverly spelled wrong in two different situations across two different notes, which Robert himself said that only the killer could have known to send. So now we've got the same kind of thing popping up here. This was not a new thing, but now we, we know that Robert's aware that he's being walked down this path. And the interviewer did this well, and he actually sat down and you, you have the ability to see him try to process through and figure out how he's gonna navigate this. He did it well of walking Durst into that to where he didn't have Durst throw up all of his walls right away or anything like that. It naturally flowed into there, but the interviewer did that extremely intentionally and stressed over that a lot. So he did that very well, and now what we're gonna be able to have the ability to see is what happens when an interviewer who knows how to talk to people to get them to emote or respond more authentically, what happens when they do their job well and what happens to a nonverbal communication display when some of these emotions start boiling out, whether or not the person wants them to. So let's, let's watch. Just didn't want Susie's neighborhood. So obviously I want to ask you about the cadaver note, the famous cadaver note. Can you read me the spelling of Beverly Hills? Beverly Hills, Hills. Police, 1527 Benedict Canyon, cadaver. Same. I also wanted to make a note just a little tiny second ago when talking about the mistakes on the deal. He goes and intentionally points out the same spelling mistake. This is still perception management as he's pointing out his own flaws. You are more likely to like him if he points out his own flaws. You get that already. So he does that quite, quite willingly. And then after that though, he talks a little bit about the zip code that it's in. Like this is the one that you wanna be able to be at, almost as if he's trying to really immediately divert attention away from the spelling mistake. Uh, it's got the spelling mistake, look at it. Uh, perception management is here, but let's not think about it too long. Let's move over to here. Let's think about these other things over here. So that is something that's interesting that played out there. And now we're, we're coming back around to it and it looks like he's about to call out the same mistake again. Misspelling. So Beverly spelled the same way on this and the same way on this. Same misspelling. What does that say to you? Well, I mean, the writing looks similar and the spelling is, is the same. So I can see the conclusion the cops would draw. Or the... It looks extremely similar. An argument could be made that it looks like the same person wrote it. You'll see it here in a second and it'll be up on screen. But you can hear that even though it looks so overtly similar. And you can even think back to the Ramsey case with Jean Benet Ramsey and the ransom note that was left there and the obvious similarities between the ransom note and the writing of Patsy Ramsey and their unwillingness to admit the similarities despite them being obvious. So this is coming in here a little bit and Durst is like, okay, well, you know, I could see the similarities, they have block letterings, and but he's still trying to downplay it. Whereas somebody who's genuinely not at all related to the case in any way would be like, yeah, that looks like the same person wrote it just casually. As an average of observer of handwriting, it looks like the same person wrote it. So he's trying to play that down and really go into the technicalities of it. And that's just interesting. And yes, I think an innocent person would do this because if they were being framed and then that's all that you have. But I also think that a guilty person would do this as they try to downplay the similarities that are there. This really becomes evident here in a second. Let's continue. <laughs> writing exemplar person would conclude they were both written by the same person. And I think... Okay. 
Now this is difficult to circumvent. <laughs> really hard to, hard to ignore. Robert's doing a lot of burping here. Now nerves heavily, heavily affect digestion systems. So it's very common to see the psychophysiological response of burping and gastro irregularity when somebody is very agitated. Upset stomach, butterflies in your stomach, that ringing feeling that's in there can make you burp. It's all centered around intense agitation or nerves. Intense, it has to be intense for this to start popping up. And this can be caused by a number of things, obviously, and this, this can be triggered by anything so small as like a public speech going up and speaking in front of people can cause intense fear for some people. Or it can be caused as maybe seeing your handwriting compared in front of you in an irrefutable way makes you feel a little nervous when you're being accused of being a murderer. So we're seeing that pop up and that one, that one's hard to control. No matter what Robert would have done there, you can't stop that from happening. So the fact that it's spilling out, that's an uncontrollable tell of intense agitation and it's popping up in a very, very crucial point. Let's continue. I think this, I mean, this is a comparison of the two, right? Which is uh, very similar. So I guess the question is, did you write the cadaver note? No, I didn't write the cadaver note. So you wrote this, but you didn't write this. Definitely wrote this, but I definitely did not write that. Once again, he's doing his verbal repetition. No, I did not write the cadaver note. Definitely wrote this, definitely did not write that. Verbal repetition of the question that was being asked. And now we're about to get to a really important question here. Really important one. I guess I'm searching for a way, uh, among other things, to understand how um, two people could misspell Beverly. I'm searching for a way to figure out how you didn't write the cadaver note. Cause it's okay, now we're seeing some other tells of intense agitation from Durst's body, the rest of him. His face, he's fairly okay at maintaining, but we know that he's not okay at maintaining some other things. And now we're seeing a pretty big venting deal here as he's probably starting to perspire. We get really warm, especially down in these areas where it's pretty warm. So he's doing some venting here, he's clenching his hands, and this is also a sign of agitation. People will oftentimes also carry it all the way up to their heads. We saw that in Chris Watts. So we're seeing this pop up here, and he's now trying to downplay even more the similarities, and we'll see that. We'll see this play out. So similar. Well, what I see as the similarity is really the a misspelling in the Beverly. Other than that, the, the block letters are block letters. How else would you write a, a block letter than, than that? Okay, I'm gonna pause it here while this is in focus and on the screen so that you can just look and as the average untrained handwriting analysts that we all, or most of us are, <laughs> except for those of you who are watching who are trained handwriting analysts, we'll look at this and just be like, yeah, that looks really, really similar. It at least looked like one person was trying to copy the other person, if not the same person writing the same thing. So that's just how it appears to us. But there are definitely differences, as there are even when a person hand writes, you never write the same thing twice the exact same. There's always variance, but it still looks so eerily similar that it's undeniable to just the average viewer. You'll see that. I mean, I mean it's, it's almost like a, a typed thing. It's going to look, two typewriters, it's going to look the same. So you wrote one of these, but you didn't write the other one. I wrote Big self-soothing gesture coming out there again that we know is centered around intense agitation. This one I did not write the good apple. And can you tell me which one you didn't write? No. Good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Big, big, long held self soothing gesture up here of intense agitation. That's important. This doesn't have much left to go. We'll let this play through and then we'll talk about it at the very, very end. 
and it's five after four. Perfect huh? timing. Can, can I have this? Or are you going to say? Yeah, I want you to have it. Thank you. Oh. Do we have Bob's bag nearby? You want to take one of these sandwiches, Bob? Yeah, but we can wrap one up in an accident. So sandwiches. <laughs> what are we going to do with them? I am going to go use the restroom, which is right here. So some things to note that will add some context to stuff, just physically speaking. They're talking about, do you want to take one of these sandwiches? As if it's something that they're already familiar with, you want to take one of these sandwiches. Likelihood is, is that they may have eaten around that area. I don't know that, but if they did eat before it, that could also have caused the gas, the burping, to uh, surface a little bit more easily. So that does mean that we have to consider more heavily the context. So say I had just watched only this little blip. Well, that wouldn't have given me enough to work with because there's not the rest of the context of everything else that we've seen and gathered to be able to work with. At that very moment, I could be like, okay, so he's burping here, which can be seen as an intense sign of nerves and agitation, but he also just ate, so I can't really hold much to that. So now considering though in context, we could see that that nerves and agitation, while it could be seen as possibly being inspired by the food, we know that there are many other instances that are still red flags that help support this as being more of evidence rather than just an average everyday movement that doesn't have any meaning other than he just had a sandwich earlier. So that's where context is important. Let's watch this. I know I said we would watch this all the way through and then I talked, but I just wanted to make note of that while I was there. They did maybe just eat and have some water or something like that. Well, maybe this is the bathroom. Yeah, that's- You're all right. This is the bathroom. Okay, so that's the ending of everything, right? Pretty hard to kind of ignore what was said in there, except for if you, I mean, Robert's asked about this obviously in court multiple times because this is pretty bad. This is pretty bad when you admit to something on audio recording in private, it's pretty bad. And Durst's response to this was that he wasn't saying what happened, but more of like a story or a narrative of what they thought happened. Like he was rehearsing it in his head as if they were thinking about it. And it was kind of like this, like, well, no, it, that's just, you know, that was my thoughts of it while I was saying it. And it's like a he said, she said sort of situation. You can't disprove that, can you? Well, no, technically. But considering earlier, now that we know that Robert self-talks himself through intense situations and is known to do that out loud, then that means that what we see here is likely that same thing, a self-talk through a difficult situation. That doesn't mean that he's making up some sort of weird storyline or something like that that he tried to say that he was. It means that he's talking himself around a difficult subject that he doesn't know how to speak best about. And so in this area, I do believe that he was self-talking himself down from whatever had just happened there and admitted his own guilt. He was in private and he had no, no <laughs> concept of somebody being able to hear him. No idea. So why would he be like, oh, I would, I would out loud say that. And we know that he has the pattern for not doing that, but rather for just talking himself through his own thoughts. So Robert Durst, he was sentenced and uh, he is in a rough way. This was here recently within the past couple months or so. Um, I believe in actually September is when a lot of this wrapped up. And he held firm the entire time to not being guilty. But after we look at this and consider all of the evidence that was given, not only the physical evidence that trapped him in his, 
his crimes, but then the nonverbal evidence that showed that the physical evidence wasn't planted. It wasn't somebody that went so far out of their way to frame Robert in every form and fashion of his life from him being a child all the way to him being in prison for his last days. That wasn't the case because we saw Robert characterized by certain actions that almost primed him to a point of these next level of crimes that he did. And we see this disconnect of the right and wrong sides of things on a smaller scale and then play out in a much more large and gruesome scale as something so small as stealing a sandwich to dismembering a neighbor. And the same emotional disconnect exists across both of those. We know he's capable of doing atrocious things and not being emotionally affected by it. We saw him draw distance between himself and whatever it was that was negative while still perception managing. A, that was one thing that he was good at was manipulation, is having people believe that he was less guilty of something because he admitted partial guilt to something else. He did it so well. And it all ended up falling apart, obviously. But there's things that you can learn from this, absolutely things that you can learn from this. If you're with somebody who no matter what happens, it's easy for them to take on some level of fault, but only in a way that makes them seem like they're not actually at fault for the main thing. It's a very subtle form of manipulation that can exist in day-to-day -day relationships. Along with that, if you're looking at a person and they're characterized by this detachment of themselves from everyone around them, not only on maybe like an income or just life circumstance level of wealth and poverty, but then also maybe even morally, if you see something like that come up where you know, you watch somebody do something very flippantly and not not really crucial, like steal a sandwich or a candy bar, but did so with little regret or turmoil, that could mean that they're more comfortable doing something more extreme than that. So just be aware. So in these situations, even though the case is wrapped up, even though it's all done and blah, 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 that doesn't mean that we can't learn. And I appreciated being able to spend the time that I did pouring over Robert's case this has not been a super popular one, honestly, on the channel here. And that's too bad. I think that this is a good one to be able to look at, to be able to pick up on a lot of those subtleties and nuances of a person who is good at lying and still ended up getting caught out in their lies by their more or less body language. So I hope you did enjoy this. If you do have another suggestion, especially for true crime, I'm gonna be upping that content a little bit here on the channel. I wanted to hold those polls that I did recently to see what it is that does really interest you and true crime is still very high up on there and I appreciate that. The issue is, is that I wanna be able to make sure that I'm getting true crime content out to you that you do care about and that you'll watch because that's the point of this. If I wanted to just make a video and upload it, I would just make a video and save it on my computer. I would like you to be able to appreciate the video. So if you like it, hit the like button, hit subscribe, do all those things. If you can think of others, please let me know those so that I can get you good applicable content that has some, some educational and fun value in there as well. But, but, without further ado, that's all that I've got for today. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys. Oh, 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 oh,